hear me okay on that with the microphone. I wanted to do the lapel mic, but it's got a weird buzz. Um, we'll just wait a couple minutes. Uh, did all of you sign up online? Yeah, or a couple of you did, yeah. There's a few people who signed up online, like maybe five or six, and the numbers aren't adding up right now. If yeah, okay. Yeah, Brian, Brian just said some uh, randoms are going to show up, and then there's a few people who registered. So we'll give them a few minutes. Uh, let's just sort of look at why are you here? Why does this interest you? What are you hoping to get from this? For me, I like to think that I'm more interested in sort of immersing the fishing stuff, but I always like to think, well, I like gold now that I can take away from, Great. you know, every what it does to you or every yep. thing you see. So that's what I like to do. So okay. what Look, you give me that I might looking for the nuggets. Give it to someone else. Yeah. All right. So is that most people? Anything in particular that you want covered? Like I've got, I've got a plan, but <laughs> might as well see what you're interested in. Alcohol on diet? Yes. How does it stop our the process of becoming mm. That's actually on the slideshow. So that's a good one. It's not not one that often gets covered or asked. Um, so we can talk a little bit about that. We better record this then. It's more presentable. Yeah, yeah, I'll 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 just send them the recording. Just be like, yo, some of the ladies said you need to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> just tell them it was a carrot. That's yeah. It. Okay. Cool. And so everyone all of you train here. Mm -hmm. Well, I train at home, but it's too far away. Yeah, where are you based? Eastern Beach. I don't know where that is. Between Stanley and, no, between Wyndham and Stanley. Oh, okay. Mm. I mean, this whole northwest corner is just gorgeous. Every time I come here, I'm in Hobart. Um, oh, yeah. I'm in the, on the dry side of Hobart, and <laughs> like, you know, every time I go into Coon Valley, I'm like, oh, it's so lush, but I come up here and just the, Green rolling hills and the red dirt is just and the beach and the beach, yeah. the beach yeah <laughs> beaches are beaches and I'm not huge on beaches I'm a, I'm a mountains and forest kind of guy and it's just gorgeous up here it's just a lot of neat stuff going on also you have that little chapel cafe with the butterscotch and that's uh, <laughs> that's a big thing for me I really like that okay so maybe we'll delve into things let me just double check that this is. Functioning. Excellent. All right. Okay, so the whole idea here, and if you can't see anything or whatever, let me know. If you got questions, go ahead and ask as we go. There'll be time at the end for more discussion, but if something pops into your head and you're like, but what about, we can cover it then, or if it's like a big topic, we'll make note of it and cover it at the end, in case I cover it as well. So the idea here is this is kind of broken into... <clears throat> three main components. We're looking at understanding what is nutrition, looking at the, the definitions, which you may or may not be familiar with. Some people are familiar with some aspects of, of nutrition, some are less so. But we're going to look at things like calories and macros and what they mean, what each macronutrient is and what it does and why we need it, including alcohol, which is a macronutrient. Uh, and then we're going to look at how to create balanced diets and meals. Uh, and then we're going to look at some of the more adult habits. How is it that we actually take this information and eat like an adult? Because lots of high school kids learn the basics of nutrition, but ultimately <clears throat> don't use it for any practical value. So how do we take the knowledge and then apply it? Because knowing stuff without application is sort of useless. You know? So we're going to cover a few topics here. And again, just shout out if you have questions. Can I lean against this? Well, it's too early. Can you tell us about you? I was just looking, you got a Bachelor of Science. Yeah. What's your, what's your background? You know, that's a, that's a good question. I kind of forget to do that sometimes. Uh, okay, so my background. Uh, I'm Josh. I've got a weird background. Uh, I started off in uh, combat sports. That was my, my early introduction to exercise as a late teenager, getting into combat sports, mixed martial arts and things like that. Uh, and then from there I went on to study manual therapies. So my first career was as a massage therapist and dry needling practitioner. <coughs> uh, from there I went and did uh, the coaching qualifications, the PT qualifications, I shouldn't really call them coaching, they're mostly just red tape. Um, but I did that first time around maybe 11, 12 years ago, 
uh, did a Bachelor of Health Science with a major in Chinese medicine. Uh, so trained acupuncturist herbalist, uh, which I don't use at all. <laughs> I use the health science. My, my thing is holism. The idea is to, to understand people and how to keep them healthy, um, and then understanding that there's a lot of variation there. So my, my focus is always from a health standpoint, and hence, you know, eating like an adult and the brand Strong for Life. This is about longevity. And so from there, I studied uh, a handful of other more specific qualifications, powerlifting, uh, general coaching type stuff, sports coaching. Uh, I did a post-grad in strength and conditioning uh, and just sort of built everything out of there, this idea of like, what does it take to actually make healthy people? Uh, and part of that is being strong, part of that is being mobile, part of that is being uh, fit and in shape, but not specializing in one domain, looking at a whole picture perspective. Uh, and obviously, nutrition is a big part of that, <clears throat> but we often get bogged down in the minutia. Are you getting enough of X micronutrient from this one obscure Amazonian plant that you can only order from this one company, or are you getting enough of your Herbalife supplements? And like, you get you get bogged into this, like, you're majoring in the minors, and my big thing is like, what are big general habits that anybody can do to make sure they are strong and capable for as long as they want to be? Um, so nutrition as applied to that, uh, as applied to a general health framework. Um, and I've been in the industry for about 12 years now, uh, originally coaching like group strength and conditioning at a women's gym in Melbourne. Uh, I spent a few years focusing on unboxing and competing in that and training people in that before focusing on more of like a generalist approach. So weird, a bit of everything, generalist thing. Does that help? Okay, cool. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, the focus today is really learning how to apply the knowledge you have to eat for the life you want. And this is, again, the application aspect. Uh, oh. There we go. So we're going to look at what health is and kind of what that means to you. Often, it's a little bit different uh, for ind individuals, person to person. We're going to look at understanding nutrition terminology. Again, we're not going to focus too much on the small stuff, but we are going to try to have a make, sure, make sure that everyone has a general understanding when we use some of the common nutrition terminology. Uh, we're going to look at how you can create a balanced diet. So diet meaning the general ways that you eat, not necessarily a specific way of eating, but your way of eating. How do we make that balance for what you want in terms of outcomes, uh, and then how do you even proportion a meal? Uh, and then we're going to look at the actual, how do you eat like an adult? How do you apply this? What are some general habits and rules that you can apply to make sure you're staying on track? So this stuff is like everything I do, generalist, and then you look at how you can apply it to your circumstance. And that means, you know, if you're trying to lose weight, you can use these rules. If you're trying to gain weight, you can use these rules. If you're trying to maintain, you can use these rules. Uh, so it's about you having the power to kind of move things around for what you want to accomplish. Health. So, generally speaking, when we're talking about health and what fitness is, it's going to come down to your activities of daily living. So, activities of daily living are the things that you do every day. So, when we talk about fitness, people, I get this all the time, people are like, hello, Coach Josh, can you help me get fit? And the first thing I say is, what does that mean? What does that mean? Fitness is part of that whole application. It's, are you capable of doing the things that you want to be capable of doing? If you want to run marathons, you need to practice running. If you want to compete in powerlifting, you have to powerlift. If you want to be able to walk up the stairs to work without being winded, you can do a lot of things to get you there. If you want to be able to play with your children or your grandchildren without being winded, fitness is specific to those tasks. Health is your ability to continue to accomplish those. Uh, nutrition and exercise requirements are going to depend on what you want to do. So the more you understand the foundations and then how you can apply them, the better off you're going to be able to tailor that to your outcome. Uh, and then often we talk about like what's optimal. Again, domain dependent. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, and then, as always, my big thing is you need to master the basics before you start tinkering. I get questions usually from young guys, especially like teenagers and early 20s and stuff, and always like, what do you think of this supplement? 
and I was recently talking to a client I used to train in boxing when he was 14, seven years ago. Uh, and he's been chatting to me on Facebook these days, talking about you know, how do I get bigger, how do I get stronger. And he's like, what do you think of testosterone boosters? And what do you think? I'm like, dude, you are, you're boosted as much as testosterone can be. You're a 21-year-old male. You just need to eat more. Like, this, that's the thing. But understanding that you, if you don't have your sleep, if you don't have your basic nutrition, you don't have your training dialed in, you don't have good stress management and recovery, you don't need to tinker with anything. You have to put the foundation of building down first before you, before you decide what kind of sconces and outlets you need. You know, like food, sleep, training. Get that down, and then you can talk about stuff like, do you need to take creatine? So, yeah, foundations, foundations, foundations. Let's go. Let me see. Can I get a few tips? What? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep, go for it. Probably for, say for, 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 you'd be happy. <coughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. And, and, and of course, I'm taking some information as well. Yeah, yeah you might as well. Of It'd be impressive if you could not take in some information. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, understanding health. And then let's break down some of these definitions, the common things that we hear when we talk about nutrition. Everybody has heard of a calorie, right? Mm -hmm. Or a kilojoule, whatever unit of energy measurement. We've all heard of it. How many of you know what a calorie is? What's a calorie? Well, okay, that's, that's a conversion in kilojoules, but what is a calorie? <laughs> Yeah, it's a unit, unit of energy measurement. So, <laughs> don't shoot. It's a unit of measurement for energy. Uh, yeah, it is. That's all it is. It's just a way for us to measure how much energy is in a food. Have you gone? Here for the talk? Yeah, I'm going to go in. That's right. Join on in. Uh, so, we've just sort of gotten into the meat of this, looking at health as a general concept, uh, and then digging into definitions for nutrition and stuff. So, what is a calorie? This is sort of the foundation of eating for your outcomes. How much energy are you taking in? A calorie or a kilojoule is a unit of energy measurement. You use them in, in, in heat, you use them in measuring how much uh, electricity or power you need for something. There's lots of ways to use it, but when we're talking about food, it's just energy measurement. How much energy are you taking in? Because energy balance is everything. You either need more or less energy to do the things that you want to do. And generally speaking, calorie counting, although tedious, is going to be the most accurate way to measure how much intake we're actually bringing in. Uh, it gets a little fiddly when we talk about output, how much energy you're expending, because unless you're doing like the actual uh, masked up VO2 max style, checking how much carbon dioxide you're releasing, you're not going to get an accurate reading. The the little counters on your apps and your watch and things are mostly terrible. Uh, so <clears throat> it's tricky, it can be done, but we can pretty accurately figure out how much energy we are breaking in or bringing in. And ultimately, we need to know whether or not that is suiting our goals. Are we taking in too much, too little? And we'll get into that. So calorie counting can be very accurate in the grand scheme of things, but it does get fiddly, and we'll talk about some of those fiddly bits. Uh, proportional eating is another way that you can track generally how much you're bringing in. Uh, I do always recommend that people go through a calorie counting phase and we'll get into that a little bit. Proportional eating is looking at basically like how much is on your plate and understanding portion sizes a little bit in, in a little bit more of an intuitive manner. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit too as well. Obviously they both have drawbacks. So let's look, in, uh, look at nutrients. So nutrients, it's a few different types. We have macronutrients and we have micronutrients. In simple terms, macronutrients are things or the constituent parts of our food that are used for fuel. Micronutrients are not fuel, but they have other biological functions. So you don't use vitamin C as a form of energy, but you do need it in the synthesis of energy. You need it for Lots and lots of things, just like you need your zinc, and your vitamin B, and blah, blah, blah. Micronutrients are your vitamins and minerals. If something is labeled a vitamin, we call it vitamin A, B, E, K, A, B, 
60, whatever it is, a vitamin is something that you have a necessity for. You are required to intake this. Uh, so there is no such thing as an optional vitamin. Minerals, phytonutrients, other types of micronutrients generally are more optional. Phytonutrients, there's no essential need for them, but there's a lot of benefit. Uh, sometimes, sometimes we find that people uh, of certain, uh, let's say, ideological leanings in terms of their diet will say, well, I don't really necessarily need this micronutrient, such as B12. Uh, in those who are on the vegan side of things, but you will eventually go insane and die if you don't have B12. Something called a vitamin is something we have recognized as essential to life. Uh, and that doesn't mean there aren't things out there we haven't found yet. I mean, vitamin K was only discovered 50, 60 years ago. We're always discovering new things. So what we really need to focus on in general is are you fueling yourself according to what you need, sort of macros, and then are we getting a good range of micronutrients? And if you're eating whole foods, you're probably fine. I'm assuming most people are generally eating whole foods. This looks like a group of people who aren't just living off of mass gainer and pre-workout. Yeah, good. Very good. I'm a big fan of more traditional ancestral food ways. You know, cook like your great-great-grandparents would have, eat nose to tail, that kind of stuff. It generally covers your nutrient needs. Uh, keeps you healthy, gets a little tricky when it comes to trying to hit body composition goals if you're not really aware of what you're eating, but we'll work on that. So, everyone knows what protein is, right? Yeah. And exactly how much you need to get, right? How much? 100 grams. 100 grams, why? <laughs> <laughs> At least you have a guy. <clears throat> so, you know, it's important, right? Yeah, it's really hard to get though. Is it? Why is it hard to get? The steak is so expensive, and I'm not particularly fond of protein. So. What about mints? What about chicken? Fish? Yeah, it's pretty low in protein, depending on how much you have. I chicken, like lean chicken meat, <laughs> meat is going to be more protein dense than steak. No, I need one chicken. But then again, I unfortunately can't have one. Two chicken breasts will get you about 120 to 150 grams of protein. What's that? Yeah. So we know it's important. There's lots of things that we can do to get more protein. Uh, first thing is we need to know it's important. So that's why I said it's the most important of your macronutrients. So macronutrients, again, like I said, are energy sources, but they have other functions. So generally speaking, we want more protein in our diet because, well, it makes us feel full. It's one of the key triggers for feeling sated, full as opposed to bloated. Most people are used to this feeling that stops them from eating, and that feeling is usually, I can't fit any more in. Feeling sated, high satiety in your food, means you have other triggers that are saying, you don't need to eat anymore. You may not have an actually distended stomach full of pasta and pizza, but you're like, well, I ate a big steak and some veg, and I feel fine, I'm good, I don't need any more. And that feeling is very different, and that's part of having a high protein diet, it helps trigger that more effectively. So we need protein for things like tissue repair, uh, bone, muscle, skin, hormones, immune system. We often forget, people usually think protein is muscle, but only about 11% of what you intake in protein there is a, will go to your muscular system. Your skeletal muscle, when I say skeletal muscle, this is the stuff that lets you move and interact with the world. Often this gets downplayed in uh, certain health circles that are more plant-based. They say, ah, you don't, you know, it's just, 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 just your, you know, showy muscles. But if we take away your skeletal muscle, stuff that lets you interact with the world, if you take it off your frame, you will only weigh about 10% of what you weigh now. It is the majority of your body. It is the single reason you can interact with the world around you. So it's important. But even if you're getting enough, only about 11% of what you intake is going to go to that because it takes an excess for your body to go, I have enough to give towards this system. Because your bones, collagen is what makes your bones rigid and hard. That's a protein. 
That's what gives your bones their rigidity. You have to have enough protein every day to replenish this. Your hair, skin, and nails, made out of protein, collagen, holds your skin onto the frame underneath it. You need it for that. Yeah, so just to be clear, this collagen is also protein? Collagen is a protein. Right. Type of protein. Uh, you can eat collagen, you can take collagen supplements, but it's not really worth your time because it's a partial protein. It's better to get whole proteins that your body can then break down into partial proteins like collagen. Uh, and collagen is what gives your point, point your joints uh, their sort of soft springy ends. It's the end of the joint materials uh, when the cartilage the cartilage is mostly collagen. Right. So is that is that collagen like that? Is that coming from eating that particular food, or is that your like body breaking down the protein into collagen? Yes, it's both. Okay. So if you drink a lot of <clears throat> broth, right? That's mostly melted down bone bits. Generally, all the articular parts, the joint parts, are full of collagen. Collagen, when it's cooked, is called gelatin. Uh, it's the same stuff. It gives it that little jiggle. And that is the same soft, spongy, squishy, lubricated ends of your joints. So we need collagen for replenishment of like joint material, but also for the rigidity in your bones, also to keep your skin attached to the frame underneath it. Uh, there's lots of uses for collagen. But it's easier and more effective to take in whole proteins that your body then breaks up into the things it needs. Whereas a lot of supplement companies want to sell you on like collagen supplements because it's good for your hair, skin, nails, and your joints and things like that. But you're getting a partial protein. And if your body's like, well, we actually need more of these amino acids, these little constituent parts of proteins for other stuff, we're going to use it for that first. And if you don't have a full complement, you're kind of limiting your ability to to replenish what you need to replenish at that time. So we just need to get in a fair amount of protein. Uh, and this is gonna be the focus for everything we do. If you're not getting enough protein, the amount of carbs and fats you get, it's not as important. If you have excess protein, it gets used as energy just like every other macronutrient. If you have excess of any calories, it gets stored as fat, even if it's protein calories. But Protein is used for so many systems, for building blocks, that excess isn't usually an issue. The hardest part is eating enough of it, uh, especially with most the way that most people sort of are, are raised eating with a, uh, a carb-based eating system. We have our staple carbs, and then we add something to that, as opposed to we have our staple proteins, and then we build a meal around that. And so first and foremost, you should always be getting your protein requirements, especially if you're active, and especially if you're over the age of 20. The older you get, the less efficient your digestive system is, the less efficient your body is at using the nutrients we need. So we need more of them because there is more waste. So the older you get, the more protein you should be having, not the less, because you're able to use less of it. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. We'll talk a little bit about digestion and some of the uniquenesses of how we break things down. But ultimately, this is the most important thing that we get in our diet, aside from the calories. So if we look at what proteins are, we break them down, we have our amino acids. Uh, you might have heard of branch chain amino acids, BCAAs, a very common supplement. It's one of those things that a lot of people are like, oh, I gotta take the BCAAs. But BCAAs are isoleucine, uh, leucine, and, <coughs> oh gosh, I'm kind of forgetting it now. I think it's valine. Anyway, three, primary essential amino acids. If you are eating a complete protein source, like whey or any of your meats or eggs, they're full of BCAAs, full of branched chain amino acids. You don't need to supplement amino acids if you're having whole proteins, which are made up of all the amino acids. Um, I take a BCAA supplement now. I've always sort of been like, ah, what's the point? Because there really isn't a point if you're getting enough protein. But if you're getting a lot more, uh, say, vegetarian sources of protein, beans, legumes, pulses, grains, uh, you have less of the leucine, and leucine is the amino acid that triggers muscle protein synthesis. So the ability for you to build and develop new muscle is sort of triggered by this one amino acid, uh, which vegetarian sources have less of. And so this is why traditionally they talk about mixing and matching uh, like beans and rice, grains and legumes, because they have different amounts of amino acids. And in the winter, 
Oh, I do get a fair amount of, of meat with my breakfast too. I do a lot of <coughs> baked beans with breakfast. Like that's just like one of my winter staples. I do slow cooker baked beans, like Boston baked beans with some molasses and mustard uh, and smoked pork, pork hock, which is available at Woolies in the winter, but not during the summer. And so it's super cheap, delicious, and I slow cook it overnight. And then I have all these beans and pork that I throw maybe some eggs on or a slice of cheese, have a bit of toast. And that's a staple for a lot of my winter breakfast. I want something warm, but I don't want to spend forever cooking. Uh, and <clears throat> so I take a BCAA as opposed to a like whey protein supplement during the day now because one, it's delicious and tastes like watermelon. Uh, two, I find that some whey supplements make me bloated. Some people have difficulties with digestion of whey protein supplements. And I found recently, because I probably have been doing it for my whole life, uh, I'm like, God, I just can't stomach one. Uh, and so I got a lot of clients who use non-milk protein supplements. You can get like ones that you can mix with water and they taste like lemonade and stuff like that. Uh, or adding in some extra BCAAs because although I'm getting a lot of non-animal protein sources, bumping up the amount of leucine I get in my diet will help with that muscle protein synthesis. So I'm kind of mix and matching pieces just because of what I feel like eating right now, knowing full well that if I'm eating more, like I've been digging chickpea curries, been making that at home because it's good. And there's nothing wrong with chickpeas. But I have to be aware that I'm probably going to want to boost some of my essential amino acids to get the most out of my training and recovery. So that's why I'm doing BCAAs as opposed to just a whey. It's purely because it's helping me find a balance that I can continue to do every day and it's delicious. Even as a lifelong coach, I get palate fatigue. I get tired of eating the same things. So it makes a match. Do you need a BCA supplement? Not at all. You're better off taking a, a whey protein supplement because they're cheap, they're available everywhere, they have everything you need, well bioavailable. But because I want to do something different, that's the only reason I'm doing it. So we just kind of have to know what all the parts are and where we're getting them. Vegetarian, like chicken, so You have less of it, but there's generally, I can make some generalizations about certain populations. Uh, if you see young vegetarians, they often don't look like they are fit and healthy generally. They just look. She's been vegetarian for some years. I think she's Good. Okay. So generally, I've, I've seen a lot of like high school age. Uh, people who are getting on the vegetarian thing and it becomes more about like being skinny as yeah. opposed to the health and fitness. I think she did have a skinny skin when she was younger. Yeah. But so there's, there's, there's often a little bit of a, a thing going on there. <clears throat> the fake meats aren't great for a lot of reasons. Generally, it's like a, a mixture of soy proteins and like just extra gluten, which can be really problematic for a lot of people. Uh, I'm not really on the fear gluten bandwagon, but I do know that it can exacerbate a lot of inflammatory conditions. Those fake meats, aside from the issues around them having to be made in factories with these giant footprints, uh, any non-animal source is going to lack certain amino acids in the amounts we typically need. So, like a soy, uh, yeah, soy isolate. If you're a vegetarian or a vegan and you need a plant source, a soy isolate protein is usually pretty good. Um, most of the studies show that if you're taking that, which is essentially just the extracted protein from soybeans, you're probably going to be okay getting enough of everything. Soy does have a little bit of leucine. <clears throat> Not as much as an animal product. You're probably better off adding a BCA or an extra leucine supplement or ideally just using whey. But if you're doing a lot of soy isolate, you're probably going to be getting enough for muscle protein synthesis and recovery as long as your calories are good. But <clears throat> I don't know what how much they're eating. So usually the, the fake meats are fairly high in protein. The quality of protein generally is low. Like an, an isolate soy protein seems to be okay. But like a gluten-based protein, so you get like high protein pasta, a lot of those are just extra gluten. Uh, and gluten has a bioavailability, bioavailability of about 50%. 
So not very easy to digest. You don't, if there's 100 grams of protein, you might get 50 of those. So there's a few things going on there. Generally in young people with, that are more active, if they're eating enough volume, they're gonna do okay. If she's very active, I'd say supplement. Mm -hmm. You said she does like two supplements. Yeah, and she's probably gonna be fine. You know, it's, it, it's like, think so. <laughs> yes. Well, there's there's a lot of other health benefits of meat besides just the protein. There's a lot of fat soluble vitamins. There's a lot of <clears throat> different types of, of fatty acids as well that are beneficial that we're only just discovering are beneficial. Like uh, what is it? CLA conjugated linoleic acid uh, has a lot of health benefits that we're only just discovering in the last handful of years, and that's mostly found in red meats. Um, so there's a lot of benefits aside from just the protein. If we're just talking about the protein. <laughs> If she's eating enough in general and supplementing a bit, she's probably fine. Um, but, you know, not optimal. This is kind of that whole eat like an adult thing, finding that balance. It might not be optimal. You might not be a high-level professional athlete with the way you're eating that. But if it more or less suits what you want to get out of life, you can tweak it a bit, maybe add a little supplementation, and it'll be fine. So, it's it, yeah, there's no hard and fast answers on that one. Um, but fake meat's gross. <laughs> so, yeah. Putting that out there. It's just cheating. Uh, so we do want to get as many complete proteins as possible, and your animal sources are going to be the best. We probably have seen, on that topic, probably have seen this picture on the internet at some point. I snagged this years ago from uh, Dave Summers. Uh, you've seen this one before? Ah, years ago. I think it was really popular, too, when that Game Changers movie came out, uh, where they're like, peanut butter sandwich has as much protein as a steak, which is 100% a lie. Like, there's no wiggle room there. It's absolute bullshit. Um, but this this infographic you see, or this, this post you see on social media uh, fairly commonly, where it's like kale or broccoli, it's like 100 calories of broccoli is 11 grams of protein. 100 calories of steak is 6.5. Uh, and then they're like, just eat vegetables. I see you scowling. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure oh, that one out. Figure it out because I think I looked at my fitness pal like just the other week, and like mostly like you know meats, but hardly no, that's carbohydrates. So yeah, I mean, is it calories? It's both. Is it more more calories? Um, let's let's dig into it. So <laughs> seventy grams of sirloin or porterhouse or like not super lean, not super fatty steak. 70 grams. How big is a 70 gram piece? Like that? 14.2 grams of protein and 100 calories. So if we look at that last slide, 100 calories is what we're comparing. And this is where it gets kind of fiddly. 100 calories of steak is that. Three cups of cooked kale is already shrunk. It's going to give you about 7 grams of protein and 100 calories. Three and a half cups of broccoli. Is actually more like eight and a half instead of eleven. <laughs> That's is, and this is where they're like, this is this is where. Yeah, well, either way, like three cups of bro three cups of cooked broccoli, three cups of cooked kale. That's a lot. It still it still doesn't add up though because it's that. If you go back to the other slide, yeah. Three three and a half cups of broccoli is one hundred and fifty. 105 cows, but it's only 8.7. Yeah, oh no, it's, it's definitely like, I, we don't know where their data set came from. I use my fitness pal for this just oh, because okay. everybody has access to it. Um, you know, there's, there's wiggle room. We'll talk about how actually a lot of these numbers are not 100% accurate. But let's say, okay, it's close enough. Even if it was 11 grams, and you need 100 grams of protein a day. So you need 10 times 3.5 cups of broccoli. 35 cups of broccoli. Is that with Well, that's just for the protein. Add whatever you want to it. 35 cups. And if we look at the calories, how much you'd have to eat, if it's 35 cups, you know, 10 times, that's, that's what, 10,000 calories? 10,000 calories to get the bare minimum amount of protein. It's not a complete protein. It's not all usable. And you're probably going to have some digestive discomfort from that. So this is where, like, when you actually look at it, it's kind of like the, the memes where, like, throw a whole bag of spinach into a pan, uh, and then when it's cooked, there's one leaf there. Yeah. You know, it's like three and a half cups yeah. Yeah. for one serve. 
it's it's impossible. And this is you know where the vegetarian stuff becomes about. It comes about how much can you actually eat within your goals and get the minimum requirements. And this is energy versus nutrient density. So let's dig into this a little bit here. So if we look at best sources, when I say best, we're looking at per 100 calories. So what is those nutrient dense sources for protein? This is a whey protein. So 100 calories of whey protein is about 20 grams. So a normal 30 gram scoop of whey protein is usually like 140 calories, 150 calories. So 20 grams is going to be 100 calories. That's about as good as it gets. So if you just lived off whey protein, besides the impending digestive discomfort that would come from just living off whey protein, uh, if we say you need 100 grams of this, you could have five scoops across a day, and that would only be 500 calories. 500 calories is less than what you would probably have in a meal. Yet you would have more protein than you need all day. So this is density of, of nutrients. You don't need a lot of food to get exactly what you need nutrient-wise. But that's not a lot of calories either. We need that energy for various things. Chicken breast, very similar. So this is where we're looking at really lean foods. So tilapia or just white fish, canned tuna, very, very lean, meaning there's a higher proportion of protein, much less fat, basically no carbs, basically no fat per serve. <clears throat> this is why people who are really, really strict with their macro count, like bodybuilders and athletes, they're going to be eating a lot of this boring stuff. Chicken breast, tin tuna. It's efficient, it's effective, it's boring. And this is where we have to decide what suits our goals at what time period. You know, like I, okay, yeah, I'll eat some chicken breast here and there. I don't like tin tuna. That's no. <laughs> just pet food. You, know, you take one of the most beautiful foods in the world, like tuna steak, and you make it one of the most awful things you could eat. It's just... Whale and vegan parts on whale. <laughs> so, what is vegan protein? What do you mean? Like a supplement? Yeah. Or like just vegan Part sources? Oh, okay. You'll be up here. So <laughs> it, it, like, this is where I was talking about like soy isolate. Uh, it's the same stuff. Like an isolate means it's just basically the protein taken from a source. So a whey protein isolate is the protein taken from whey. Uh, soy protein isolate is the protein... Generally, you also have the cheaper options like a protein concentrate. Uh, for whey, protein concentrate is usually cheaper. You're having like 80 to 84 percent protein as opposed to like 92 to 95 percent protein per serve. Uh, it's cheaper though. If you are lactose intolerant, the concentrate are bad because there's more lactose in it. So whey is a milk product. Whey is literally a liquid left over from making cheese that they dry out. So that's why most of the great ways, whey proteins, they'll advertise coming from New Zealand or Australia where all of our dairy is really high quality. It's sought after around the world because it's all raised on pastures out here. It's fresh, we got green grass year round, very high nutrient quality. And then you make cheese out of it, all the leftover whey is the liquid stuff, dry it out, boom. Protein is a fantastic industry. Uh, it's a good way of like using the whole, using the whole product. Um, so, <clears throat> You know, a few things to think about with that, but in general, like whey is one of the most bioavailable proteins, meaning you can get the most out of each serve than you would with, say, something from tofu or lentils. And so if we work our way down the list here, per 100 calories, if we come down here and we're looking at something like uh, peanut butter, which is very common. Per 100 calories, you get 4 grams of protein, approximately, there's a few fiddly bits there. How much is 100 calories of peanut butter? It's not. It's not. It's like like one level tablespoon, maybe. No one eats a level tablespoon. Lots of people eat peanut butter. Peanut butter is pretty popular. Uh, so like one level tablespoon, and you get four grams. So if you want to get your 100 grams, you would need 25 of those. So that's 2,500 calories, which, you know, if you were a real active person, a moderately muscular, moderate weight male, or a highly active athletic female, that's a, probably a normal amount of food you'd have to eat. But you'd need 25 tablespoons of peanut butter if that was like your protein source. So as a protein source, it's shit. Uh, 
which is also what's going to happen if you decide to try and eat that many tablespoons of peanut butter. <laughs> You're going to shit yourself. <laughs> and this is where we get into that, that vegan vegetarian trap where it's like, oh, no, I get enough protein, I eat nuts. Sometimes I hear mushrooms. Mushrooms are even worse. They're really, really low protein. They're really low in most nutrients. They're kind of like styrofoam. They're delicious. They add flavor. They don't have much nutri nutritional value when we talk about essential nutrients. Like a lot of vegetables, there are beneficial phytonutrients, plant-based nutrients that add benefit but aren't required for life because there's a lot of populations that don't eat mushrooms <coughs> and somehow they survived. There's a lot of populations that don't eat kale or acai berries or whatever superfood and somehow we've all survived. There's a lot of things that might be beneficial but aren't essential. And nuts is one of those ones where a lot of people will be like, oh, I get a lot of mixed nuts for my protein. Oh, I'm going to have a high protein snack. I've got some mixed nuts. And nuts are a fat source that happen to have a little protein. So if we look at trying to get what we want, you have one cup of almonds, and you get 73 grams of fat, and 36 grams of protein. It's also 850 calories. Now, if we look at how many calories most of you would probably need, it's probably around the 1,500 to 2,000 calorie mark as maintenance, then more or less for exercise and body composition goals. So let's say you need 2,000 calories because that's the what they put on the cereal box as the average. You could have two and a bit cups of almonds, and you would get about 70 grams of protein. It's not enough. It's not also a balanced diet. So this is where we run into like if you are looking to optimize and you need say a 75 pound male, highly active. Uh, fairly lean, needs about 150 grams to 200 grams of protein a day. 75 grams, sorry, 75 uh, kilograms, 150 grams is generally more than enough. How are you going to do that without shitting yourself? This is the problem we have with fat sources as primary nutrient sources. Is you just they're limited. You you can't eat that many nuts and leave the bathroom. Like it's just. It, it's like trying to down olive oil and mix it with protein powders. It's not going to work well. The other side of the spectrum is people who will say, oh, I eat my quinoa, which was really popular, you know, a handful of years ago. Everybody had to have the quinoa, you know, Bolivian superfood. <clears throat> so good for you. It's perfect food. <coughs> it's just circle rice. Like, it's, it's just the same sort of stuff. Um, there's some benefit to it. But, you know, quinoa, legumes, beans, pulses, uh, they are carb sources that happen to have some protein. Generally speaking, beans are a very healthy food. Populations that eat a lot of legumes tend to have very good health markers. <clears throat> they make you feel full. They keep you sated and you know happy. A good energy source. But you know, a cup of quinoa might be 40 grams of carbon, eight grams of protein. So your grains are going to be a little bit lower than say your pulses and legumes like lentils and beans. Uh, but one cup, eight grams of protein, 10 cups at 80, we'll need another, you know, if we go 104, uh, 13 cups of quinoa for you to get your protein. It, it's just a terrible source. <clears throat> it just can't be done. You mix and match. This is, this is how we make complete and balanced meals. We can get protein from these things, but if it's your primary source, you're eating a massive amount of calories massive amount of calories to get your bare minimum and it's not even going to be the bare minimum because you won't really <coughs> use all the protein found in there because it's not a complete protein and not very bioavailable. So generally speaking your animal products or my, uh, your animal products are going to be the most effective ways of getting your protein with the least amount of calories. This is nutrient density as opposed to <coughs> caloric density. Peanut butter is very calorically dense. There's a lot of calories in a very small package, but it's very low in protein. A piece of chicken breast is very high in protein and quite low in calories. This is how you can mix and match things to find what works for you. <coughs> if we work down this nutrient density scale, protein density scale, you know, steak a bit less because there's more fat per serve. 
meaning there is less space per serve for protein. Uh, cottage cheese is one of my favorite. I, I'm big on yogurt and cottage cheese uh, because you can usually find it discounted uh, and about to go off. I do a lot of yogurt and then like you go into Woolies and it's like all half off and so I'll buy a tray of those little single serve yogurts. <coughs> because the secret is, and they don't want you to know this, but yogurt doesn't go off, it just becomes more yogurty. Like it's already got off. It's fermenting milk and then it's hermetically sealed and then a month later it's exactly the same. Yeah. So I buy heaps of that, and then I will, uh, if it's high protein, cool. If it's just regular Greek yogurt, I throw a scoop of protein powder in it, and get like 40 grams of protein, and it's delicious. A bit of berries, maybe some granola. I was saying that the year I went this spring. Which one? Cottage cheese, and I was very lean. No. Sounds great. Cottage cheese is underutilized here. It's not really big on the menu. In the U.S., I grew up living off of buckets of cottage cheese. <clears throat> Super common in the U.S. Well, kind of. Yeah, because it's super high in protein, but he, you know, he, he did all his bodybuilding in the U.S., and it's on every grocery shelf in the dairy aisle. It's a bunch of different options here. It's still little, little tubs, but there you buy it in like one kilo tubs like you would yogurt. So it's, it's very cost effective. Uh, very high in protein. I like to take like a, what's the yesterday before I found a bucket of cottage cheese in the back of my fridge I forgot it was there. And I just pulled out, we had some strawberries, chopped that up, a little sprinkle cinnamon, boom, delicious. Very high protein. Like a sweet stuff, huh? It's, it's, it's sort of a neutral. You can do it savory, you can do it sweet. It's actually really good. If you like sardines, you can do this like sardine cottage cheese pate, blend it all up with some herbs, put it with a bit of avocado on some toast. Great. <laughs> It's a really good way of just bulk up. Uh, my sister posted in the Facebook group uh, a cottage cheese macaroni and cheese recipe, like a high protein one that's using cottage cheese to help build the sauce. Like it's a really useful depth of thing and you usually get about 30 grams of protein for one cup, 25 to 30 grams for a cup, which is a great snack. Greek yogurt is a bit lower. Low fat Greek yogurt is key. You're gonna get a lot more protein. And then now even Woolies has their own brand of protein yogurt. They usually get like 15 to 18 grams for a serve. I like to do that as a cold breakfast. I take that, scoop of vanilla protein powder, some frozen blueberries that I thawed out, handful of granola, beautiful. Uh, and you're like 40 grams of protein right there. How am I getting the extra protein in It's usually just removing, yeah, it's usually removing liquid. Yeah. So you just keep taking out some. If you see the high protein yogurts, like they might, they might add in some more whey or, or proteins from the milk, uh, but generally it's just like almost solid. Like the more protein in it, the harder, like thicker it is, <clears throat> which I kind of like, yeah. makes it more fun. But as we move down, so non-fat Greek, eggs, eggs are a high quality of protein, but they're not actually very high in protein. There's more fats in there. Uh, this is a hard one to dose appropriately. A lot of people will ask, you know, how much, how many eggs for a serve? And it's going to be like three or four for most people. And there's only about six to seven grams of protein per egg. Generally, we want 20 to 30 grams per serve because usually 20 grams of high quality protein has enough leucine to send us into muscle protein synthesis, building new muscle mass. Uh, so, you know, three eggs gives you about 21 to 20, about, about you know, 18 to 21 grams of protein. Um, and that can be a little bit hard to eat. Some people don't want three eggs, it seems like a lot move that way on the scale, then you don't feel like you're eating as much. Uh, lentils, beans, hard cheeses, like the further we get this way, the less protein dense the foods. Uh, yeah, I mean, tilapia is your white fish, canned tuna is white fish in a can. The, the white fish are leaner, so more protein. So salmon would be, salmon I would say is generally maybe around the steak. You know, 15 to 17 grams per 100 calories, give or take. Like it's a great nutrient, but very nutritious. It's good for you. Don't shy away from these whole foods, but just be aware that if you're like, I have to get 100 grams of protein, you might want to sub out salmon for a leaner fish. You might want to stay away from the ribeye and porterhouse and do like an, an eye fillet or something like that. Something. I mean, of course, you're going more and more premium, too. You probably just need to 
eat lean mints. Do a lot of cooking with mints. That's an easy one. Lean mint. You can do so many things with mints, you know? I cooked that once at home and it was hot. I just put out it for the taste of my crack compared to the fatty stuff. Well, and again, it's like how much fat do you need? Like, you know, add some olive oil. Like I do uh, uh, kangaroo mints nachos. That's a, that's a family favorite. You just get the cheap kangaroo mints from the shops. So you got $12 a kilo. I uh, fry that up with some Mexican spices and some olive oil, you know, kind of make it a bit crispy. Throw that on some corn chips, add some you know, beans or sour cream or salsa, or whatever flavors I want. Top it with a bit of cheese. High protein nachos, you know? Like you can do the same thing with pizza. Like you just, you, you learn how to make food good. Because mince is boring. It's what you put the mince in or put on the mince that makes it good. <clears throat> but if it's too lean, you're going to have to add some fats. <clears throat> All right. Talk about nuts, carbohydrates. So we're harping on about protein because it's important, right? If you are active, if you want to stay strong and capable your whole life, you need to get as much protein as you can within the balance of what makes life enjoyable. If you're a bodybuilder, if you're a high-level athlete, or you're delving into more athletic endeavors, it's not always about what's enjoyable, it's about what you need to accomplish those goals. And this is about finding your balance. Okay, carbohydrates. So something I forgot to mention is protein. Uh, protein and carbohydrates both have four calories per gram. Something to keep in mind. Same caloric value per gram. Carbohydrates will break down into glucose. We need glucose for various functions of the body. Our brain requires glucose. Do we need to take in exogenous carbohydrates, meaning from the outside in our diet? No, we don't. Without people doing keto, survive. Because we can produce that glucose or other energy sources called ketones from proteins and fats. So we don't have to take in carbohydrates. <clears throat> if you're in a survival situation, you're going to want to look at fats and proteins. You've been watching alone? Are we on that? This is awesome. Yeah, cool. All right, well, no spoilers. I've, I've, seen, I've finished it, but I've, I've seen too many people get mad about spoilers. Uh, but the thing, uh, you know, no one's like, gosh, I wish I had some rice. Uh, everyone's like, I need some meat. I need to kill something and eat it. And we, we need these proteins and fats. And this is a little bit of a tangent, but uh, fats are also essential. And when... Europeans went and explored places they'd never been to, uh, there was an issue where they would just survive off of rabbits or deer, these very lean native animals. Uh, Aboriginal people in Australia as well had this problem where a lot of these native animals are so lean and so low in fat, you will actually get what's called rabbit starvation by eating too much lean protein without enough fats, and you get diarrhea and die of malnutrition. Uh, because you need fats for a lot of essential systems and even for parts of protein digestion. So we, we need those protein and fats. We don't need carbohydrates. But if you want to do well in competition and performance, you need them. Not essential for survival, but my gosh, are they a very powerful tool to leverage for so many things. If you need more food, because you are a highly active athlete and you're finding a hard time recovering, or you're not maintaining the weight you want, or you're a young person, it's easy to get calories from fats and carbohydrates. It's harder to pro on proteins. <clears throat> uh, primary sources in a you know generally healthy, balanced diet are going to be your starchy vegetables, grains, legumes, fruits, and vegetables. Obviously, we have our highly processed sugary foods, which are all very carbohydrate dense, uh, but we want to use those sparingly, and they are also a great tool for performance. There is nothing wrong with sugar. What's wrong is people's relationship to sugar, or the relationship they think they have with sugar. Uh, we, we can use carbohydrates to fuel a lot of activities in recovery. That's a whole other thing. It's getting into like sports nutrition, but keep in mind, don't be afraid of carbohydrates. Just try to make them as wholesome as possible. Real food. Um, I say something else on that. Oh, yeah. So, often people will come to me and when we start working together, we'll talk about 
food. We'll do a food journal, look at where they think their weaknesses are, where they need to improve. <clears throat> I can't even count the number of times that someone has said, oh, I have a hard time with carbs or sugar. And I can't count the number of times that that has not been the case. So how many here thinks they have a problem with carb consumption? Sugar. Let's see, let's see your hands. Who, who here has a hard time controlling the amount of sugar that they eat? Sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I won't get chunky when I get started, but yeah. 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 So a lot of people have this challenge, but the thing is, it's not necessarily the case. How many of you have a really hard time not sitting down to a bowl of plain white sugar? How many of you are just like, man, I just can't wait till I can get home, sit down for the TV with a bowl of white sugar and a spoon? No thanks. Nobody. You don't have a problem with sugar. You have a problem with the packaging. You have a problem generally with what we call hyperpalatable foods, which means fats and sugars. I've never seen someone who couldn't stop eating white rice. Plain flour, white sugar, like these are not real food. No one binges on that stuff. It's a combination of sweet things and fatty things. You know, how many of you overindulge in plain boiled potato? How many of you overindulge in chips? Greasy, fried, hot, crispy chips, or pizza, or garlic bread? It's flavor, it's salt, it's fat. Carbohydrates mixed, creating what we call a hyperpalatable food, a food that is triggering so many pleasure centers in our mouth that our caveman brains can't handle it and we can't turn it off. One thing for me, salt and vinegar chips. I'll eat that till my mouth bleeds. <laughs> There's no off switch. I don't like crave them all the time, but once I get started, it's like just not stopping until I can't feel my tongue or there's nothing left in the bag. And it's one of those things that just triggers all these, you know, monkey brain things that says, just keep going. There's no trigger that says, stop eating until you're too full or there's nothing left or your mouth is bleeding from the vinegar powder. <laughs> so rarely do we actually have a problem with just sugar. It's everything else. I mean, a lot of the sugary drinks that people drink, they're not just sugary drinks. They're caffeinated as a flavor enhancer. There's an addictive property to that. You know, people generally aren't just mixing extra sugar into their water. There are all these other things that come with it. Yes, it's a problem because it's sweet, but because it's sweet and salty and savory and greasy, then we run into issues. But again, you know, reframing what our issue is <clears throat> can be a powerful tool to understanding what we need and where we're actually at. Again, rarely, okay, <clears throat> never have I had someone tell me, they just sit down to a bowl of white sugar and can't stop eating white rice. Like those are very high carb sources. No one is addicted to that. It's everything else around it. It's donuts, it's pizza, it's pasta, it's hot chips, it's sweet caffeinated energy drinks and fizzy things, it's never just sugar. So that can be useful. Maybe it's not though, I don't know, you decide. Uh, so carbohydrates. Very powerful, useful tool. Very enjoyable part of eating. Just be mindful of where they come from. Fats, now this is where things get tricky. One gram of fats has nine calories. It is over double the caloric load or caloric density than our other macronutrients, which is why it's super easy to overeat calories to fat source, which is why a lot of bodybuilders and people trying to change their physiques lower the amount of fat in their diet because it's a very easy thing to overindulge. One tablespoon of peanut butter is never one tablespoon of peanut butter. It's a mound of peanut butter on a spoon and it's got as much calories as a sandwich. Small package, a lot of calories. This is our primary long-term storage fuel too. We're, our bodies are good at handling fats, generally speaking. That's why all of our excess storage is fats. Our bodies metabolize that well. That's our storage of calories. Uh, and it's easy for our body to turn excess fats into stored fats. 
pretty good at that with carbohydrates. It's a harder process with protein. But ultimately, any excess will be stored as fat. That's our storage system. Uh, did forget to mention as well that carbohydrates are stored first as glycogen, which is stored carbohydrate in the muscle and the liver. If you are doing high intensity work, stuff like uh, you know uh, circuit stuff, anytime you feel that burn and heaviness in the muscles, you are using up your glycogen stores. It's glycolytic activity, it's anaerobic activity. Anytime we're not doing aerobic activity, we're using more of that glycogen stores, and that's where replenishing that with carbohydrates <coughs> is a valuable tool. Uh, right, so we do store fats with a, with a good energy source. We do have a few labels of fats. We're not gonna get into this too much, but you've probably heard of saturated, unsaturated, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, trans fats. They're just all different categories of fats, and it's based on where carbon molecules are and how open they are in the chain. They have different properties. Uh, we do need poly and monounsaturated fats. We, we do need saturated fats, but we can create those as well from other fat sources. <laughs> uh, trans fats are not good for you. They typically come about when you take a particular fat, usually an unsaturated fat, and it gets twisted through a chemical process or heating, and it is detrimental to your health. Uh, cholesterol is a type of fat, or made up of fatty acids, one of those things that get, has gotten demonized, uh, not really that bad for you to take in. You do make everything you need endogenously <coughs> inside your body from other sources, so you don't need to like focus on bringing cholesterol, you'll make it, but avoiding eggs because there's cholesterol in it is silly, <coughs> because there's so many other health benefits to them. Uh, yeah, and we need it. You know, we talked about the rabbit poisoning. We need fats in our diet. And so if you go too low fat, you do have health issues. You need it for hormonal regulation. Most of your hormones are made out of fats. All your sex hormones are made out of cholesterols. It's an essential thing. Don't fear fat. Find balance. Primary sources will find animal fats, of course. Uh, nuts, avocado, coconuts, and our seed oils that people mostly cook in. 70% of the calories in the U.S. diet right now come from fats in the form of seed oils. So oils, industrial oils, they use for cooking everything you see out there, all your prepackaged things, all your, a lot of your bakery items, everything that's fried in a restaurant is fried in some sort of industrial uh, canola, safflower, sunflower, uh, cotton seed, grape seed, all these oils that are easily produced in bulk and are very cheap. It's actually the bulk of the calories in the U.S. diet right now and in a lot of the Western world. It's pretty, pretty ubiquitous here as well. It's not just U.S. anymore, um, which is funny when people complain about <clears throat> Western diets being animal-based. They are actually plant-based in terms of how much calories you're getting. 70% is from plant sources. And protein intake across the West has been going down for decades. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a lot to, you can break down there. So when it comes down to how much we actually need, we kind of talked about protein intake, but let's actually look at exactly what you need. So it's going to depend on your goals, but there is sort of a minimum threshold for protein that you should be getting. So generally speaking, you're going to want between 1.2 and 2.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. There's some wiggle room there. If you're really overweight and you're trying to get down to weight, you know, you might not want two grams of protein per kilo of body weight. You would calculate that based on ideal weight uh, or lean mass, a few things. But generally, if you're between 1.2 and 2.2, you're fine. Sedentary people, generally, between 1.2 and 1.5, 1.6 is good enough. 1.6 to 2.2 is more than enough for active people. Basically, if you're getting 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, you're set. More than that, it's kind of diminishing returns. Sometimes bodybuilders will go upwards of three grams of protein per kilo of body weight. There's no detriment to that, except in your ability to enjoy life. Because the amount of your diet that is taken up by lean protein sources, you just, you're just on chicken breast and whitefish. But they usually do that because then they still get to eat something instead of not eating something. 
And so because their calories start getting lower and lower, they're trying to maintain as much muscle mass as possible, recover as best they can. So they're looking at those incredibly dense protein sources. Supplements, lean meats. Uh, so if we look at this, if someone say we've got 75 kilo males, so typically higher uh, muscle mass, anywhere between 120 and 150 gram, grams per day is going to be more than enough. We would never want to go less than 84. That's very low. You're going to have some diminishing returns there. <clears throat> You're not going to recover as well. Not going to build as much muscle mass. And this is where we start looking at how do we balance our meals. So. If you need 150 gram, grams of protein a day, which is sort of what I look for, 120, 150 works well for me. If I get 30 grams per meal, I'd have to have five meals. 150 grams. That's a lot. That's a lot of eating. So making sure that I have high density protein sources is going to help me make sure I don't have to eat all day. We do want to spread those doses out a bit. It's easier to get 50 grams across three meals. So one good piece of lean meat for a meal works well. Or a bigger meal, say for breakfast or lunch, like I'm doing the baked beans, uh, I've got more calories there because I add things like cheese and eggs, <coughs> some toast, bulks up the calories, got a good handful of uh, smoked pork, the pork hock in there and the beans themselves. I'm sitting around 30 to 40 grams of protein, but probably closer to six and 700 calories. Um, if I'm really hitting it hard for breakfast, my big breakfast is sitting around 1,000 calories. Um, still sitting between 30 and 50 grams of protein. So just kind of understanding where your balance lies between what you need, what you enjoy, and what you're trying to accomplish. You know, do the math, understand what you need, and figure out how you're going to get that across the day. I have to have at least one high protein snack at some point during the day to tip me up towards the 120, 150 range. That's generally what most people do. You have three meals and you'll have a protein snack mid-morning or mid-afternoon or both. And that could be a cup of cottage cheese and a yogurt in the afternoon or something. <clears throat> so we really need to make that the focus. Now, any questions on that so far? No? He says um, it's hard to, it can be hard to get you a goal amount of protein uh, just on, the, on the best of days, on the best <coughs> day potentially. But uh, if, if say one person was uh, intermittent fasting, but yeah. it's a smaller window to get that protein, um, yeah, you know, the, 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 there's lots of science and you know uh, that, uh, the benefits of intermittent fasting coming out. However, it could be that um, potential sacrifice. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. So generally speaking, all the benefits of intermittent fasting come from <clears throat> basically not eating too much. If you put yourself into caloric restriction, you get the same benefits. If you're not eating while you're asleep, you're intermittent fasting. So that's still the recycling process going to be happening anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like the, the benefit, like, it's usually just a good system for people who work that way to reduce the amount of food they eat during the day. Yeah, it's a simple system. Yeah, that's it. It's, a, it's just a simple framework. And this is where when you have short feeding windows, it becomes really challenging to get enough protein. Right. I've met, I've met people who will do like a, a 5 2 or a 6 1 intermittent fast. They take a whole day off eating. <clears throat> Almost every one of them is overweight because there's a rebound effect. They're like, oh my God, I've you know, done all these amazing things for me. I starved myself for two days. And then you binge for five. You're eating more than normal. And this is kind of, there's probably some connection to the same mechanisms with running. A lot of people who get into running, uh, unless they take it to really high levels, go through a phase of losing weight and then gaining weight because there's a, a an extra hunger effect from certain activity. So they just end up eating more or feeling like they're supposed to be eating pasta all the time because they need a carb load for their 30 minute run the next day. Uh, so it, it's just again that balance, there's pros and cons. There's no, there's nothing wrong with intermittent fasting except the least anabolic thing you can do is not eat. Anabolism refers to building tissue. If you are trying to gain muscle, you should not be not eating. You should be eating. So not eating does not help you build muscle. There is nothing about not eating that makes you more jacked. 
in fact, there's a lot of things that make it harder to recover because you're trying to eat less. So <clears throat> if you look at the high end of the spectrum, the people that are most jacked are bodybuilders. They have mastered the art of being big, lean, and buff. You don't have to take it to those extremes, but if you look at their systems, you can apply those to any situation. If you want to lose body fat, you have to have less food in your life. If you want to gain mass, you have to have more protein. Or if you want to gain muscle, if you want to gain mass, you have to have more food. If you want to optimize your ability to gain muscle mass and recover, you have to eat frequently and get high doses of protein across the day because that's more opportunities for recovery, more opportunities for building muscle. The most important thing that you can do as you age is build muscle mass. The single greatest predictor of longevity is how much lean muscle mass you have. It's one of the most protective things that you can invest in as you age, building more muscle, because it's the single reason that you can interact with the world. And one of the things that kills people as they get older is their inability to do their normal activities of daily living. And as they fall apart, we end up with back and hip injuries, which then become fatal in older ages. Build muscle mass. And, and actually, if we're talking about that, build a booty. Glutes, strong glutes, are one of the most protective things you can have going into older age because they protect your back, your hips, and they're the reason, one of the biggest reasons you can walk. So, glute training is big. Getting your protein consistently and increasing that amount as you age are really key to good health in old age. And so, we can take some of those bodybuilding concepts about feeding across the day. Don't take it that extreme. Like if you really want to maximize it, like every two to three hours, you get 20 to 30 grams of protein, even overnight. Body, like high end body goes, wake up, eat a cup of cottage cheese, go back to sleep. I'm not doing that because I don't care. But that system can be applied on a smaller scale. If you're not eating, you're not gaining muscle. If you're not eating, you're consuming tissue. If you're eating enough protein, you'd be consuming mostly fat tissue. If you're not, your body will consume or catabolize the muscle tissue for other systems. So all day you're going like this. I'm consuming my tissue, I'm building tissue, I'm consuming my tissue. The more that you build, the more muscle you'll have. The more time you spend like this, the less muscle you'll have. It's not interesting because I've heard uh, about uh, building muscle being associated with the more muscle, the muscle hair you get fancy at a certain age, the, the, the uh, less your all cause mortality, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, um, all cause uh, mortality rate is. Yeah. However, I've also the longevity of intermittent fasting is that, isn't that, that seem almost contradictory in that sense right there. They're both associated with longevity but in different ways, hey? But you have to define intermittent fasting. Yeah, yeah, sure. And if you equate that across calorie consumption, as far as I've seen, Every benefit of intermittent fasting comes down to not eating too much. So every every benefit, if you just say, okay, if these people are intermittent fasting, they're consuming this many calories a day, or they got this level of body fat, and you compare it to someone who's not intermittent fasting, which is not sure. real. Everybody it's more of intermittent fasting. Exactly right. That's right. So it's just kind of like what lens you're putting on it. Sure. And again, it's defining because I, I have people ask me this all the time. Of course. What do you think of intermittent fasting? Like, it's about, yeah. Do you eat yeah. during your sleep? Okay, you're intermittent fasting. Cool, you've got a 12 hour feeding window. You know? But it's just a way of limiting calories sure, sure, sure. for the most part. Uh, but some people do well with it. Some people naturally will rebound and fight it. Just play with it. That's it. It's about finding that balance. Now, when we talk about. Oh, sorry, was there other questions? No. no. We talked in the beginning about calorie counting uh, versus what I would call proportional eating. You know, looking at portion size being the main thing. There are some problems with calorie counting. Uh, and this is not to dissuade you from calorie counting, but just, again, the more knowledge that we have and the more understanding of how to apply it, the better off we're going to be. So there are some limitations with calorie counting, and that's, you know, mostly manageable. But if you're sitting here and you're trying to figure out your macros and your calories, and you're like, why isn't this working? Then, well, then you need to change that because there are limitations to the system. So if we look at the calories that are reported in my fitness pal or the various government databases, there are fluctuations. Like what potato, so when they, when they check calories, they put them in a little incinerator to measure the energy output that they check the calories. 
What potato did they put in the firebox? One medium potato. What happened to the medium potato? This one's lumpy. This one's round. This one's long. Which one's medium? So if we look at something like that is way above and measurable, a, in the example here is a six ounce, six ounce filet mignon. So a smallish size piece of steak, lean steak. That individual cow is different from the next cow. And you can have a difference from 320 calories up to 500 calories. So there could be 150 calorie difference in that one serve. If that's your main staple across the week, and it's 150 calories difference, you know, that's three, six, nine, that's a thousand calories across the week. 1,050 calories across the week. That's half a day's food difference. Just because, you know, whatever data bank you got that from isn't the same as the piece of steak that you're eating each day. There are variations in this. One large sweet potato. Now, they've, they've recorded everything from 230 calories to 700 calories. First of all, how big is large? And then there's the individual differences in the, the vegetables. So we have limitations there. What data bank we're using is not necessarily going to match up with what we're consuming today. We do our best, but this is where, when it comes to calorie counting and stuff, we need to be mindful that there will be variations and that what we put into the system and what we plan for ourselves will need to be tinkered with based on our results. If you are not getting the results you want, don't be like, ah, oh, it's, it's broken or whatever. It's like, this is not the right number for me. I need to change this. Uh, and food companies may use any of five different methods to estimate calories. And so this is coming from the FDA. A lot of that data comes out of the US anyway. FDA permits an in accuracies up to 20%. So like it's on the other slide, individual information that the companies give to the databases could be up to 20% difference. Uh, so 150 calories could be anywhere between 130 and 180. Is there anything we can do about that? No. We find a number, we test it, and then we adjust it based on the results we're getting. Problems with calorie counting continue. So the total, if we look at actually what one gram of carbohydrate or protein or fat looks like, the amount of calories is actually a spectrum. One gram of protein, exactly four calories. Not, not exact. You know, it's actually sort of anywhere between like two and six. Fats, you know, nine point five down to point five. Carbohydrates between four and point one, and this is because you have the total calories per gram of macronutrient on this side. We have the calories that are available for absorption. It's never 100%. And then we have a number of calories that are not absorbed. And that depends on your digestion as well. So we have this spectrum between like what's available, what on average is actually, so what on average is actually available for absorption. This is where we talk about bioavailability. And then the amount you typically won't get from that or will get from that. Some people are more effective than others. It could be a huge spectrum there. Um, good question. Let me come back to that. I got a, I've got an anecdote. Uh, okay, so the things that will affect how it's absorbed could be something like how you actually cooked it. So when we talk about processed food, what process? What are we doing to food that is processing? Well, we always process food. We chop it, we take it off a tree, we kill it, we cut it into bits, we cook it, that's all processing. What we process for is to make more nutrients available. <laughs> if I gave you a handful of wheat and I was like, okay, eat this, most of that is not usable to you. We are not ruminants. We're not animals with multiple stomachs to sit there and ferment and break down these hard to digest plant materials. We won't get much from it. 
If we smash it to tiny bits, remove the hard to digest bits, ferment it, cook it, we get a lot more get a lot more from it. That's why we process things. Why do you cook your steak before you eat it? Why did people start cooking things? Bingo. It unlocks more nutrients. So we can get a lot more from something when we process it. It makes it more digestible. And this is, you know, pros and cons. Stewing foods makes them very easy to digest. What do you give sick people, people with stomach problems and difficulty getting nutrients? Well-cooked liquid foods. If you blend stuff up, you're going to get more from it. So processing makes more nutrients available, which means generally you get more calories because it's pre-digesting. So how you prepare a food to change the amount that is absorbed. A whole grain versus a highly processed and refined grain, you will get less calories, maybe more nutrients, because there's technically more nutrients in a whole grain, although they're not all available, compared to the highly processed white bread. You'll get more calories per slice from that than you would if you were to smash up some, some wheat grains and cook them in a pan. The more processing, the more nutrients are available. And this is a double-edged sword. There's also individual snowflake effect. We all have different ways of digesting things. We all have different ancestral backgrounds, and so we might have different abilities to eat certain foods well, or we might be lucky with the you know, gut biome that we have because of how we were raised or because of our parents, because we're used to, and then we introduce something new and we're not as good at digesting it. So we have the gut biome, which is the, uh, the colony, the, the living creatures that are inside of us that actually do most of the digesting. And you know, all of our plant foods, for the most part, are fermented and digested through the gut biome. Uh, we get a lot of our proteins and fats in the stomach through the breaking down of stomach acid and enzymes and things like that. Uh, but our gut biome actually helps us get a lot of the nutrients from our food. And so your individual deficiencies will vary. Plus, you know, how effective and how acidic your stomach acid is and the peristalsis of all the squishing and moving things around, that's unique too. Uh, and a lot of people are also gonna be very poor at judging portion sizes. We get down to the tablespoon of peanut butter or the medium potato, that's medium, you know? So we have a lot of things that go into how we're gonna individually get more or less nutrients from our food. Now there was a study, <coughs> I really need to get the hard copy again, but this was years ago. There was a study done in Australia uh, in, in a nutrition, and in nutrition, we have difficulties with actually doing good science because most of it is based off of epidemiology and like food surveys. If I give you a survey that said, what did you eat for lunch for the last six months? It's mostly going to be nonsense and bullshit. And yet we're going to base all of our nutrition understanding off that. So there's pros and cons to these systems. So what we want to do is do what we call like a metabolic ward study where we lock people up for a certain amount of time and give them the same food. And those are hard and expensive because you have to keep people locked up and feed them the same amount of food. So they're not usually very long. But there was a study in Australia a bunch of years ago. I think it was eight people were studied on what's called an isocaloric diet, meaning they all had the same amount of calories. They had the same food. And the thing was, this was a weight loss study. So they were all overweight people. They were fed the same food to measure weight loss effects. Seven people lost about the same amount of weight. One person gained weight. Because their digestive system was so efficient, they got more food, more nutrients from what they were fed than the other people. <coughs> Very rare, weird, like for them to even have this happen in such a tiny population study is amazing. But the fact that it does happen means that when you're trying to calculate your macros, your calories, that number doesn't matter. All that matters is are you seeing the results you want? If you are not, that number is not important to you and you need to change it. And this is where we get tricky with, with nutrient calculation. Um, would you like to take a little five minute break and stretch your legs?
Yes. We'll take five. I'll see if there's anybody asking questions on here. Hey. Two people are in here. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Mom. I think my mom's watching. It's a live stream, right? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, live stream. Actually, my, mom, my mom's actually a dietitian. Nice. <laughs> no, and what, what are you by uh, qualification? I'm Coach Josh. Yeah, awesome man. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah no, you, you said it. From what day we live in, so qualification yeah. is losing. losing. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like technically. How much, how much does someone know? How much do they research? How much do they, you know, obsess yeah. themselves to it? You know. If I mean technically, like, what's my qualification? Doctor of Chinese medicine. But I don't do Chinese medicine. But that's the qualification, you know, like uh, strength and conditioning coach. Say that, but I just just it's just coach, oh, yeah. you know, because I've done different things, and then I throw stuff out, and I take in different things, and I go, well, what gets results? What, 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 what gets people what they want? Which so many of these are uh, these modern day uh, uh, <clears throat> nutritionalists, if, 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 for lack of a better word, just the people that are actually uh, sought after, the people whose books are selling, the people who are getting mm. put onto the. The, the biggest podcast in the world. A lot of those guys are the same, you know. They're, yeah. they're doctors of Chinese medicine, if you want to put it that way. Like as in, yeah. As in, yeah. They just they're, they're, they've just figured it out themselves. <clears throat> they've just become obsessed with it, and they've done more reading and they've done more research than than the than the uh, nutritionalist next door. You know. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just, it's just kind of now. it's all the information is available. Yeah. You don't have to go through the academic process because there's a huge amount of limitations to academia. Because they're teaching you what they want you to know in the way that they want you to know it so you can get a piece of paper. And there's pros and cons. Yeah. But you can always go out and learn what's important to you and find an application that works. And you could do that probably more effectively by not being in that ec uh, academic framework. I, I did a simple uh, food studies course at university once I hated it. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I said you might be also interested. How about uh, would you would you do an interview with me after this? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interview. I'm, I, I should be able to get some B-roll and, and, and make you a little reel or whatever, which will also be for TSD. So I'm doing my job for TSD. I'll get you oh, a little yeah. a little reel as well. A little That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. It'd be fun as well. Plus, I'm, I'm I am interested yeah. in this stuff as well. So yeah. Happy to. Yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah. What was your name? Uh, Jebediah. Jebediah. Yeah, hey, yeah. I know you. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah. you from the internet. Oh, awesome. <laughs> it's not to meet you anyway, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I've I've uh, I've seen you on the internet and Brazy mentions you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny, it's some, just, of, some of my eccentric I just, activities, yeah. Well, it's just funny, like I was saying in the beginning, like I have like you don't know the internet to the real person. You know, it's so hard to make that connection. Yeah, yeah. Because <clears throat> we don't necessarily yeah, all yeah, yeah. look like our profile pictures. Yeah, we get or... very specific about what it is, or some of us do, and what yeah. we display online. Yeah. Versus, yeah, just the casual who we are. <laughs> all right. So I'll try to keep it in the same ballpark, though. You know, oh, so I don't care. Yeah. Talk about whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask you a question about what you were touching on before? <laughs> Mum's a back. Um, how do you know from a coach perspective? You don't know. But in terms of if you've got somebody who's got that outlier, the same one that won't make, if you're trying to drop the risk of them being a poor recorder or a poor counting their calories yeah. versus that person who's not losing weight constantly, where you like, is it hard because statistically every other client is a Yeah, it's hard. It, it doesn't really are matter. Are you just telling people, are you? Well, I mean, a lot of people are just consistently inconsistent, and yeah. that's what's causing. A lot of times, they're just inconsistent, and I will typically just go. I, hate I don't think it matters because, generally speaking, I go like, "Are you being accurate?" I'll do a food journal uh, that's a visual one as well, where they have to take pictures of everything. Usually, usually what happens is we do the food journal where they take pictures and write stuff down, and then we do macros, and then they go, "Oh." This is actually this much food that I'm eating. You can't always see it with a picture either, but I like to compare the two and see if it makes sense in my brain. Because I'm pretty good at judging portion sizes. Uh, but then ultimately I go, well, it doesn't matter because I'll just have to keep lowering or raising your calories based on what you want to do until we find the sweet spot. Uh, and then it'll be the sweet spot for five weeks and then we have to do it again. 
but it never stays the same. So yeah, it's, it's just it's just tinkering. You know, this is why like you never never take activity input into into account. All, I have issues where clients will add their um, like or sync up their watch automatically. And they don't think about it. And I had a client this uh, like a week ago. We just switched into macro counting for the first time. And she's like, oh, I'm doing so good. You know, I've been under every day. And I look at what my report gets. I use a program called True Coach, and it syncs uh, my fitness pal directly to that. And so I get a breakdown of their macros every day. And I'm like, you're, you're over like every day by a couple hundred. She's like, what? So, yeah. It's because I was including the activity. Like, that doesn't count because it's not right. And then obviously, it's tempting to look at someone else's market space and also see where that's the trend data that's in there. You might look and go, well, I can't see what they input. I just get macro and calorie breakdown. Yeah. So ultimately, like, if they're doing something and it's not being tracked right, and they're not seeing results, calories keep going down until they start to make sense, which means they'll. Yeah. That's right. It, yeah. Yeah. As long as we're consistent against the system, that's all that matters. It's like the body fat scales. They're always wrong, but we can measure across the same device. So if it says 30% and the next time it says 28, we're winning. But if you go 30% on one thing and you try another device and it's like 20%, that's not useful. So we just use the same system, tinker within the system, uh, and then judge everything based on the results. So as long as we have a measuring stick, even if it's not technically accurate, but we can compare it against itself, we're sweet. Cool. Ready to get moving? Good. Uh, okay, so we did a little bit about calorie counting issues. So let's look at kind of breaking down the diet. I absolutely recommend that you calibrate at least twice a year. So my thing is I'll do, you know, uh, at least sort of seven to ten days at a minimum, maybe a month, unless of like I'm eating the same stuff all the time. Uh, then I just do a sample week and just eat that for a month. Uh, calibrate. Record everything you eat into something like my fitness pal or any database you want and do that very consistently for seven to ten days at least twice a year because what you set yourself up for and saying this is my portion size this is how much i'm eating if you're not writing it down or taking pictures or drawing a still life of it you don't actually know how much has changed it's kind of like if you look at yourself in the mirror every day and you go I'm exactly the same every day. And then you look at a picture from 10 years ago and you're like, oh, I'm a different person. If you don't take those measurements, you really do not know. So always do a calibration period, ideally twice a year. A summer and a winter works well because it tends to be a little bit differently then. Uh, and just make sure you know what you need because that, that ability to actually like see the numbers, even if they're not perfect, will give you a much better understanding of what you're actually consuming. How much is that medium potato? You know, put it on a kitchen scale, weigh it. That's a 150 gram potato. You know, that's what's important. And then you really start to understand. And then you just, you know, eyeball it for the rest of the year. If you want to be accurate, though, you weigh and measure. It is the most accurate system we have. It's not perfect. We went over that, but it's the most accurate. Alternatively, this is more of what I like to do on a, an ongoing basis. It's what I call proportional eating. We use the hand. So this works pretty well because your hand is in proportion to the rest of your body. I'm assuming. I guess I haven't really seen <laughs> One day someone's going to be this tall and have hands this big and I'll have to rewrite everything. But the idea is this is proportional to your body and it's a good way of measuring generally your portion size. So a serving of protein is about the size of your palm. A high density protein piece, a piece of fish or chicken or steak, should be about that size and that thick. It's a nice little chunk of protein. That's one serving. You might need more, you might need less. If it's protein, I'd always say more. Serving of vegetables. So we're talking fibrous vegetables, generally speaking. Uh, I was talking to my sister about this. She was asking, what about beans? I was like, Generally a carb source, but you know, pretty fibrous, you know, keep you full kind of thing. Like you're not really gonna, no one's gotten overweight because they ate too many kidney beans, you know? 
Uh, so you know, I threw that one in there as well. But look at the size of your fist. If you're getting a serving of fiber vegetables, broccoli, kale, carrots, cabbage, whatever it is, that's one serving. Carbs, one cupped handful. How much potato, sweet potato, can you fit in there? Well, maybe for me, that's maybe like a half a cup of potato. It's one serving. Uh, you know, uh, rice, that's served. Uh, you could throw your beans in that category if you want to, because they are technically more carb, carb heavy, but they have other benefits. And that's, that's your serve of carbs. You know what else is carbs? Fruit. It's a carb source. Berries, that kind of thing. So if we're trying to weigh and measure things without weighing and measuring things, because a lot of people have an aversion to being accurate for some reason, <clears throat> you can do this. Serving of fats, yeah. one thumb. That's, you know, maybe a tablespoon of olive oil. It's 180 calories. It's not much peanut butter. It's not much peanut butter. <laughs> I should have. The <laughs> thing is, that's, you know, I, I wish I was smarter when I was younger. Because I was thinking about that. Because like, I know a, a tablespoon of olive oil is about 184 calories because there was a time when I was very heavily trying to gain weight. And I get to the end of the day and I need 500 calories and it's macadamia <coughs> nuts and olive oil. <coughs> Peanut butter would have been more delicious, yeah, exactly. but it makes you feel full too compared to just draining oil. So that's about an oil or a fat serve. That's butter, that's avocado, that's nuts. If we're looking at how much we actually need, that's a serve. Do you need a serve or do you need more than a serve? That depends. So let's look at that. So most adult males, let's say 70 plus kilos, Actually, in general, there, there is a little bit of a thing with if you are heavily obese, more protein might not necessarily be helpful. You could be on the lower protein side of things because you have so much extra calories on your body. Calories, and particularly carbohydrates, but calories in general are protein sparing. You don't want to have to use protein for fuel. If you're getting enough fuel, you don't need as much protein because you're not using it for fuel. Uh, but in general, <clears throat> active people, average to large-sized men, are going to want at least a palm-sized portion of protein. So two palm-sized portions of protein per meal. That's going to give you about 50 grams to 60 grams of protein per meal. If you're eating three meals. <clears throat> so at 75 kilos, which is my body weight, I need that three times a day. It's only a lot if you're not used to eating this way. This is normal. This should be normal. Eat your protein. <laughs> Smaller people, women, less active people, one palm. And I usually start people off when we do dietary habits. We just do one thing at a time. If you can't do one thing at a time, you can't do six things at a time. So we just do the one thing, and that's getting your protein. And then we look at calories, and then we look at other nutrients. <clears throat> but so in general, I start people off with three palms of protein a day. Everybody, man or woman, big person, little person, I think, you need three palm-sized portions of protein if you're not weighing measure. That's so hard for some people. And they're like, okay, I've done it. I've finally done that for two weeks. I've done three palms of protein. What next? Four palms of protein. And this is the first step. This is why we started off with protein, because it's the most important thing. Veggies. Big people, active people, two palm-sized or two fist-sized portions. Smaller people, one. Carbohydrates, two cup palms. Larger, active, more muscular people, one cup palm or one cup hand. Smaller, less active, less muscular. Or this is where we start to look at what do you need for weight loss. <coughs> Fats. Thumbs, and you can see how if we're doing this on a plate, the difference in portion sizes. This is how we kind of work out an average across our day. So how much do we eat? So you might need more. You might be on the bigger side, a bigger portion size. If you're bigger, if you're not feeling as satisfied with meals, you eat less frequently, you have to eat bigger meals. If you're really active, if you're trying to gain muscle, or you're not seeing the results you want in muscle gain. You start adding more. Two palms, sorry, two palms isn't gonna cut it. Add another palm to your meals, see how you go. <clears throat> you might need less if you're smaller, feeling too full to 
you eat more frequently throughout the day, you have smaller amounts. Uh, if you're not very active or you're trying to lose weight, you need smaller amounts, or you're not seeing the results. So in general, start by adding or taking away carbs. Well, start by adding carbs first, and then start by removing carbs if you're trying to lose weight. That's usually the easiest one, because we want to keep the protein up. We never really want to reduce the amount of protein, unless you're getting terrible protein farts. Um, then you're getting too much that, that you can't metabolize anymore. So that's just a simple way of using our hands for portion size, but we still have to see what we're doing, create a baseline, and see if we're getting results. If we don't have a baseline, it's hard to make changes. If you're eating and you have no idea what you're eating or how big your portions are, there's no control over that, and you're like, why am I not losing fat? Well, we don't even know what you're eating. We don't know what your average is. So use a system and calibrate. If you don't want to weigh and measure, use the proportional system. Eat that way consistently across a week, seeing what your portion sizes are. <laughs> See if you've changed any metrics that you're measuring. And then tinker. Take away a half handful of carbs here, a half handful there. Add a handful and just create a baseline. Either system works. Counting is more accurate. So just keep in mind, we're fueling ourselves. Food is fuel. We don't need more fuel if we're doing less stuff. We need more fuel if we're doing more stuff. Any excess will be stored in the tank. So balance that. We don't want to avoid it. We want to invest in the best quality we can. Whole foods are best because they keep us healthy and cover a lot of those micronutrients that we might not get if we're just doing supplements or white rice and chicken. Uh, if you're training a lot, you're going to need more. Training less, you need less. But most of your health results come down to how well are you nourishing yourself. And then it comes down to how well are you moving. You got to move. Humans are designed to move. If you don't move, you will not be healthy. A lot of people think they can get away with being sedentary forever, uh, and ultimately it just doesn't work out. So what I like to do is we just pick one habit, one thing that you want to change, and run with it until you can do it well, and you're seeing the change you want, and then stack another on. It's all about those little things. Tiny, noticeable things. TNT, tiny, noticeable things, is what moves mountains. Simple, baby steps. So pick one thing, master it, add another thing. Don't add 10 things at once. Uh, if we're looking at most nutrient-dense foods, your organ meats are probably the most nutrient-dense. So is this a... Who said meat? <laughs> I'm just curious, if, is this, have you always thought this way? Because I know that Liver King, for example, is not a great guy. Yeah. But he, he really, <laughs> like before him, like, oh, I'd really never heard of people like eating organ meats. Has this always been in your slides? Like, uh, yeah, for a long, long time, yeah, yeah. probably 10 plus years at least. Oh, wow, cool. Yeah, I mean, this is, everyone's grandparents ate this way. You know, like, how many, how many of you remember your parents or grandparents eating liver and onions? Yeah, St. Kitty's all right. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm a rabbit hunter, and I care about a rabbit and all the little bits that come with them, and like, like I cook it all up together. You know, in, in the U.S., when you get a whole chicken, when you get a whole chicken, you get the organs still. Yeah, you get the, the, the giblets and the liver and heart. Yeah, and, and like, you know, that used to be part of what you ate. I don't like, I don't like liver. I, I can't do the texture. Um, I love pate. So uh, one thing that I've been doing a lot lately is the European section of the grocery store. Uh, has all these little tins of liver pate. Just European style, like pork liver pate usually. It's great. Just throw it on my toast in the morning, my baked beans. Awesome. Um, but they're, they're hugely nutritious. There's a lot of benefits, especially the liver. Kidneys, kidneys, you know, I like kidneys. I'm not huge on liver, but I eat it because it's, it's good for me. Uh, heart meat's really good, especially in like stews and things. Um, so I just try to like, I also uh, will get every few months a goat from a local farm. Not alive, chopped up into bits. Uh, we always get the, the organs and they're like, what? I'm like, I'm paying for this goat, I want the whole thing. You slice up the heart into thin bits and you do your stews. I threw them in curry, liver in the curry, it's great. Yeah, but it's a lot of it is, um, 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 a lot of it is
phone and you're out of bed and you just eat them raw. I mean, if you could, but you just. Yeah, it's just. I tried eating it one time raw. I used to do. Valentine's Christmas, I was like, I, I used to do <laughs> raw liver. All the way up is like a ceremonial thing. And like, nah, nah, nah. I, I used to eat raw liver. I uh, just get a nice lamb fry or uh, a beef liver or something. Chop it into little cubes. Freeze it. Pull out a couple cubes. Shoot them back like the vitamins. You know, uh, good way to get some nutrients. You can get liver capsules. Like, there's a lot of benefits there. Just eat it. Like, if you're making stock or a stew, throw in some organ bits. It adds to the the general like depth of flavor, but then you're not like chopping down on some spongy liver. But very, very high nutrient value. Herbs and spices are a great way of adding lots of uh, micronutrients to your food, a lot of phytonutrients, things like turmeric and black pepper have huge antioxidant properties, that kind of stuff. Like adding all these little bits make a huge difference to the total nutrition of your food. Nuts and seeds have a lot of minerals in them. I mean, in theory, Brazil nuts used to be the highest source of selenium, but their soil in Brazil is losing a lot of its selenium, so there's less of that. But there's lots of minerals in nuts and seeds, things like cacao, cocoa, chocolate. There's a lot of antioxidants and micronutrients in chocolate, as long as you're eating chocolate and not just sugar milk, you know? <laughs> Seafood's got a lot. If we look at the most nutrient-dense meats, pork is number one. Technically, I think it's wild boar has the highest nutrient values of the meats on the FDA database. Um, but you know, your red meats, beef, eggs, all very nutrient dense. And we're talking about things that you can't get from other sources. A lot of your fat soluble nutrients just come from animal products. Yeah, I'm curious as well. Like, oh, I think it probably comes down to their propensity for parasites. Yeah. Um, that would guess. Yeah. yeah. Good God was punishing them by eating the pork in the sense of it. Yeah, they just, they just got worms. Uh, pork, pork's my probably my favorite meat. Although goat's pretty high up there too. Uh, it's just so you're a big proponent of pork for nutritional. Benefits. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. a great, great nutritional value. It's also like uh, economically, it's really good for small scale true. farms. Like it doesn't take a lot to raise pigs. You don't really need to pasture. They live off scraps and they dig and they eat worms and they eat well, all sorts of things. Expensive to, to buy either. Mm -hmm. Is there any problem with um a uh, very uh, generic, uh, simple, cheap? I wouldn't think so because yeah, everything. Like if you get things, fed, uh, non-grass-fed, different kind of. Things. Well, they don't eat grass, so yeah, they don't, they don't, they'll, they'll yeah. eat everything. Yeah, They're exactly, yeah. um, <laughs> in, in general, the quality of Tasmanian meats is excellent. Awesome. We have very little factory general farming, way. and even like the factory farm stuff. Like if you're talking about beef. And then factory farming. They're, they're factory finished. They spent almost, you know, seventy five percent or more of their life on pasture. Yeah, not too bad. And then they so fatten yeah. them up with some some grains and stuff at the end. And it's economic crisis. That's what it was right now. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Don't don't worry yeah, about like yeah, yeah. It, it's. And we'll actually we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, but yeah. Really, this this is the eat like an adult component now. So we have an understanding of food. I hope your understanding is better on food and what all the parts are. Eating like an adult is eating for the life you want. You know, like don't take this knowledge and then not use it, but figure out what you want. Too many people go, oh, I don't look like this, or I don't perform like this, I wish I could do this. It's like, well then do it and stop complaining. Do what you want to get what you want out of life. Figure out what you need, make it happen. But also understand, I don't think anybody in here wants to be a bodybuilder. I don't. The amount of do you want to be my do? do it, do it. But understand, you will have to sacrifice for it. This is the thing. So many people are not aware that you actually have to suffer for things that you really want, and that's cool. But understand it. You know, I never tell people they can't eat their favorite foods. You can, you can absolutely eat the things that you love most in the world. You just can't eat them all the time. This is the adult decision-making process. You understand what you want, and you make the decisions that lead to where you want to be, and you don't complain about it. You understand it. So we have to eat for the life you want. And so I have a few general habits that help this process. This is, I've created this, eat like an adult. That's right. It's a great thing. So we have, I have this eat like an adult guide or infographic that I made a few months back. <laughs> and it kind of goes through everything. The idea is you print it out, put it on your fridge, and it kind of just gives you some, some reminders. One of the most important things is apple pest. 
And some people, of course, are like, I don't like apples. I don't care. It doesn't matter. It's not about the apple. If you think you're hungry, and you're digging through your pantry, and you're like, oh, I'm just, I need to eat something. If you had an apple, would you eat it? Assuming you like apples, or if it's a pear, or a banana, would you eat some sort of whole food? If you had it, and if you're like, yes, I would love that, then you're hungry. Eat a meal. Eat real food. If you're like, no, I just really want some Tim Tams. Well, you're not hungry, you're craving something. So something in your life is lacking. You might be emotional eating, you might be tired, you might be bored, you might be burnt out. You might just be undernourished. But the first thing you have to do is understand that. First thing you have to do is, is go, oh, this is an unconscious thing. I've made it conscious, now I can make a decision. The apple test is just a simple way of going, am I actually hungry or am I eating for some other reason? And even then, if you're like, I have worked my ass off this week, I'm 100% like on point with my food, I want a goddamn Tim Tam. That's cool, you're an adult, make that decision. But make it consciously. Bring it into your awareness and decide if it's actually something that helps you get benefit in your life. Make sense? Yep. Apple test. Choose better. You can still eat the things you love, you just can't eat them all the time. So learn how to downsize, learn how to swap out. I think I, I, had a, I do a podcast and a live stream in the Facebook group, and this last week I was sort of talking about this, this common chocolate issue that people tell me about, and they're like, oh, it was really good on my food all week, but you know, and then I had a little bit of chocolate in the evening. I'm like, I don't care, chocolate, chocolate's all right. You know, if you're eating real chocolate, it's, it's got some nutrient value, it's not very high in calories, it's delicious, it makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside, it's a great treat. And I go, how much did you eat? Block and a half? <laughs> chocolate isn't your issue. The issue is your relationship with chocolate. Chocolate is not a bad thing. Why are you eating a block and a half of chocolate? What do you really need? If you want chocolate or you want the Tim Tams, eat a serving. Don't eat a family-sized meal of chocolate. Have a couple squares and savor them. Make sure it's rich, dark, delicious stuff because that actually has more of that satiating effect on you. Swap out. You don't need a large popcorn at the cinema. It's cold and soggy 15 minutes in. Get a small one. Enjoy it while it's hot. You're probably going to be just as full when you're done. So learning how to make these swaps, choosing better. You don't have to give up. Just choose better. Know where you're at with your food. Know where you're at with your what you're trying to get out of life. And make those little changes. But there are some foods that are not worth giving up. Because food enjoyment is such a visceral and, you know, primal thing about being human. Eat good food, but you don't have to eat the whole cake. Mm -hmm. If it's good, savor a little piece of it. If it's garbage and you're just stuffing yourself because you're tired, there's something else to address there. Bring it to the conscious mind. Which goes into don't eat your emotions. It also goes into don't have arguments with your spouse when you're hungry. <laughs> Make sure you're nourished. Do the apple test. Find an outlet. If you're constantly stressed out and dealing with crap from work and then you're feeding yourself because of it, that is not sustainable in either direction. You need to sort out the underlying problem or at least learn how to recognize it. You know, don't let a shitty day mess up your gains. If you've been working hard for days or weeks or months and you have a bunch of stress at work or family stuff, don't throw it all out the window because you're having a shitty day. Recognize it. Run the apple test. Am I hungry? What, am I actually hungry for an entire birthday cake at Woolies in the discount section? Like, probably not. I'm probably not actually hungry for that. Uh, so just, you know, put that barrier up that says, wait, what am I doing? Make conscious decisions and then decide. Again, there's nothing wrong with treats, but if you're doing it and sabotaging all the other effort that you put in, it's not an adult decision. 
good enough. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. A burger isn't the healthiest food, but if it's that or pasta, go with the higher protein choice. Very common thing. Like, if I put a plate in front of you and I put one palm of protein, maybe two palms of protein, a fist or two of vegetable, a thumb of fat, a couple cupped handfuls of carbs in the form of a dinner roll, healthy. If I stack them between that dinner roll, unhealthy. A burger is just a full meal stacked on top of itself. There's nothing un inherently unhealthy about burgers. But what do you have with the burger? You're out to eat usually. You get some fries. The fries are too big and there's too many there, but you don't want to let them go to waste. And maybe you had a beer or a soda. Well, you're out to eat. You might as well have a dessert. It's not the burger's fault. So just because you're out doesn't mean you have to throw away everything you've been working for. Nothing wrong with the burger. If you're at a pub, there's so many great options. You know, maybe a schnitzel, steak, burger. Stay away from the pasta and lasagna, unless it fits into what you're trying to do. Like, there are so many delicious things you can eat that will make you feel better. How many people eat an entire restaurant portion of pasta and feel amazing? Any of you? I don't, think I'm, <laughs> uh, I don't think I've met many adults who feel great after that. No. But you can eat a steak and feel pretty good. Get a burger, a bit of fish. Like you can always choose a better option. So just because you're out to eat doesn't mean you have to sacrifice enjoyment or your nutrition and throw everything out the window because you're like, ah, fuck it. It's a weekend. Mm. Because that, that's the biggest issue I see with people and their calories in general is not enough during the week eating three works, weeks worth of food on the weekend. Because they just throw out the window, ah, well, it's a weekend, what's the matter? I did good for five days. Yeah, but you ate 10 days worth of food on the weekend. Mm -hmm. So good enough is good enough. Ah, you know what, maybe I'll just get the burger a little bit. I'm gonna get the small fries. I'll get the small beer. I'll have, better yet, one of, the, uh, one of my favorite weight loss stories is a client where he cut off about 30 kilos in a year. And the secret was, we put them on what I call the cowboy diet. You can eat them as much steak and chicken as you want, but you can't drink beer, you can only drink spirits. 30 kilos. Because it's protein and low calorie drinks. Beers, wines, so easy to overconsume. A gin and soda water with a squeeze of lime, you can get just as hammered <laughs> with a third of the calories Eat a big steak, some veg on the side, you're going to be fine. And this was the thing. I said, you can eat as much steak and chicken as you want. He lives near uh, Nando's. So he's basically got, like, an all-access pass. They give him merchandise. He buys stuff so often. He comes in. He's like, I got a new Nando's shirt. Cool. He just eats chicken. Heaps of chicken. A little peri-peri sauce. Tons of steak. He just was a, at the time, he was a bachelor living on his own. He was barbecuing steak for lunch. Works from home. Go out on the weekend with his friends. He just switched to... Uh, gin or vodka and soda that's 30 kilos in a year that's massive it shows how much extra garbage was being eaten and it's so easy for those extras to add on and then for us to go oh, I might as well get the dessert oh, I might as well have another drink just go with good enough is the wine at the pub actually that good just have some you know vodka and you know no calorie lemonade or something beautiful Refreshing, crisp, have the burger, get the roast veg. It's good enough. And mistakes are going to happen. You're going to be out on the road in a strange town and you're like, I don't know what to eat. I guess I'll just go to McDonald's. McDonald's has so many options that are great for your performance. It's just meat. Just eat a double burger, get a chicken wrap or something. There's so many great options. You don't have to just go also all and have six milkshakes and large fries or whatever it is. But when you do, it's cool. Accept it. You know, I was at a friend's birthday and I ate some pizza. It was amazing. It was the best pizza I've ever had. All right, cool. Doesn't mean you have to live off of pizza for the rest of the week. You don't have to throw everything out the window. It's going to happen. You know, eat the thing you like. Get back to work. You're an adult. Deal with it. And let treats be treats. 
<laughs> this is such a common one. <clears throat> if you are treating yourself every day or every week at the same time, it is not a treat, this is your diet. You don't get treats for being alive. You don't get treats from doing the normal things you do every day. If you choose to eat garbage foods at the same time every day because you made it through the work day, well, another another day, the thing I've been doing for the last 30 years, guess it's time for another six pack of beer. This is your diet, it's not a treat. This is a coping mechanism, this is self-medication. And as soon as you recognize that, you can make better choices. Treats are great. Treats are good for you. Treats are part of the enjoyment of life. If you have been, you know, working hard on a project and you've been putting in all this effort and you're like, you know what, I'm going to go buy one of those ridiculous $15 bars of chocolate and eat the whole thing. Cool. You're not doing that every day. It's a treat. It's a reward. Waking up isn't something that you need a treat for. You've been doing the same thing for 20 years, 10 years, whatever your job is, and you need a treat every day, and you're no longer treating yourself, you're coping. So acknowledging that and recognizing that, again, is the first step of being able to say, there might be something that would be better, I would enjoy more, I would get more out of. Am I eating for the life I want? Treats are treats. So the key is, get informed, make choices that support the life you want. If you're an adult, eat like one. That's it. <laughs> Any questions? hard. But I mean, having some time to prep, making sure you have snacks that actually make you feel good, making little swaps out of what you would normally eat, choosing higher protein, lower calorie options. We as people feel best when we are nourished. We do not feel best when we are bloated with pasta. That's a very short-term mouse pleasure thing. You're like, this is delicious. I can't stop eating it. Oh my god, I feel awful. And I'm going to feel worse in the morning. Can I do much better if you're all going to eat together? Yeah. We had a pizza night not so long ago, and I decided to eat the pizza, four pieces of pizza, throughout the night. Yeah. And I woke up the next morning, and I should have actually thrown down the whole hand. Yeah. I felt shit. Yeah. I felt, yeah. But you don't know until you actually start eating healthy yeah. for an extended period of time, and then you go back and you do something like that, and you go, yeah. It's not really worth it. Mm. You you may actually have an, an issue with like gluten or something if if pizza made you feel that bad. I was just lethargic and I should have I was like I had a hangover. I should have thrown it out now. I mean there's some good pizza out there and like you know yeah. every, every once in a while we got a really nice pizza shop near us. Pizza's pretty hit and miss. They're they're good there. Yeah. Like I'll go out there and I'll I'll eat a pizza, you know, twenty inch pizza or whatever. Like I can I can eat that whole thing. And the whole time I'm like, oh, there's so much protein on this. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm sparing my protein because yeah. I'm eating more calories. And yeah. but like I I tend to go like I tend to under eat, refeed, under eat, refeed because I just I'm at home. I work at home, yeah. and I just get so caught up coaching and, and working and then video feedbacking people and writing plans and stuff like that and it's like oh it's lunch I forgot my morning snack and then I eat my lunch and I'm like I'll get my afternoon snack and so then by the time I get to the end of the week I'm like like I eat I eat well I get an okay amount of protein but in the winter I tend to try for a surplus because I'm super active in the summer yeah. and I'm out and about and doing things all the time and so I'm in a natural deficit then so I try to add weight during the winter at least a couple kilos uh, and then so instead of instead of trying for a continued surplus, I tend to go like this. 
And that means that if I need to make up an extra 500 calories in the week, it'll be like, okay, well, salt, vinegar, chips, here we go. <laughs> and this is where we get down to calories or calories. Mm -hmm. You need to hit a calorie goal based on whether you want to increase your mass or decrease your mass or maintain. You need the nutrients required to recover and fuel appropriately. But if you're getting your protein and your calories, you're generally going to be okay. Not necessarily the healthiest option if you're not consistent, but you know it's pretty common for uh, people to feed, put refeeds into diets, especially if they're trying to gain weight or consistent uh, deficit sometimes requires that we go into a maintenance mode or a reverse diet or a refeed to rev up the metabolism again because if it's really extended, you can actually slow your metabolism a bit and it makes it, you just don't feel good. <clears throat> so there's times and places for that. And it's like if you've been in a consistent deficit or been really consistent, try not to do something that makes you feel terrible, but you know, like pizza, fish and chips, you know, go out and get a big bowl of greasy, carby, whatever, but it can absolutely fit into your overall eating scheme. You just have to figure out where. Yeah. Yeah. Or accept the consequences. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I'll ask a few questions. Go for it. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the um, gut microbiome. Yeah. Would you suggest taking any like digestive, like the little pills that come with the Probiotic? Probiotic. <laughs> yeah. You said you said the pills in general. Yeah. Because yeah, I've just seen them like you know. At I police. I don't really. I haven't found that it's really necessary or beneficial. Again, like I eat half my body weight in yogurt each week, so <clears throat> there's a lot of probiotics in that. We used to get them from food. It's a pretty simple form of probiotics, right? Like that lactobacteria. What do you call it? The, the lactobacillus? Yeah, bacillus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's that's a big one uh, for, for yogurts. Like I do kefir as well, which is a different yeah. fermented one. I, I do that at home. I, I home ferment that. Um, what about pickle foods? Like? Pickle foods are great. If they're, if they're a fermented pickle, like a vinegar pickle, doesn't have as much benefit there. But there's also a lot of prebiotics that can be really beneficial in what you eat. Things like sweet potato. Uh, Green bananas and plantain are a good prebiotic. Uh, potato, especially after it's been cooled and then reheated, actually has a resistant starch in there that makes it, like it feeds the gut bacteria. It's a, it's a whole food sort of system. Yeah. I haven't really heard of much long-term benefit of probiotics except in certain cases. Like I've had a friend who had, um, what is it? He was on a... a Fod, a low FODMAPS diet because he had GERD, gastrointestinal, esophageal reflux, reflux issues. Uh, he couldn't eat anything that was high FODMAP. So certain fermentable fibers found in garlic, onion, a lot of starches. Couldn't eat that without terrible heartburn. And he went on a probiotic specific for that for a couple of years and it went away. And he had that like his whole adult life. So there are benefits. Um, I know that Saccharomyces boulardii is technically a yeast. It's one that I take, uh, and you can usually get shelf stable, <coughs> freeze dried. It's one I take when I go overseas because it's really good at preventing like foodborne illnesses. I take that in high doses just before, during, and just after international trips to places where I eat a lot of dodgy food. Um, but for long term stuff, I don't really. Think there's huge benefit if you're just getting you know, lick lick the dirt don't wash everything too much eat a bunch of fermented foods eat some whole foods you'll probably be all right if you have a specific condition there's a bit of research for various things that might be beneficial So that recipe. Take a note on like how you actually do it. Yeah. So because for me, I find I'm eating the same things over and over. Join the Facebook group. We yeah. put a bunch of recipes in there, and I have my bean recipe in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's that's a really easy one. Definitely recommend that. Um, I do that a lot. I do the yogurt with protein powder. Uh, I do. I don't have a lot of staples right now that I'm doing. I'm just kind of like doing a, a curry or something every week. 
I went and bought a ham. I've been eating a lot of ham lately because it was on sale. And ham, when stored correctly, lasts forever. Um, so I just kind of get whatever is budget friendly and then try and figure out how to cook a whole bunch of it. So curry and rice, any meat dish and rice during the week works really well. <clears throat> Yeah, soup stews. You just gotta get a slow cooker. Everyone wants to cook on the slow cooker, and I'm thinking they'll like, have some, like, a yeah. maximum yeah. curry I'll try. But now I'm, like, doing that, like, over now. I'm seeing muscle yeah. curry. Yeah, jump, jump on the Facebook group. Uh, our nutritionist, Abby, has put in some recipes for some... What she call them? Yeah, dump, dump meals, I think she calls them. Dump bags, where you just have, like... No, they're great. Big, yeah. like you have like a big freezer bag full of all your ingredients, and when you're ready to make the food for a week, you just dump it in the slow cooker, turn it on overnight, and then you got your lunches or dinners or whatever. Good. Oh, you, you said lean meats before. Yeah. Very nice strategy. Simple. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty easy one. Like, you can just yeah. do turkey mince is super lean. Um, I just, I go through phases. I don't, I don't like the bird minces. I do like kangaroo, yeah. beef, yeah. pork. Did you just you, say you were ketogenic before you said you Oh, no, I, I, I don't do keto, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I, I have. Yeah, okay, um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but you can just take any mince and just you get like a spice packet. They're like, they were having Mexican mince. Yeah. I'll eat that for a week and mix it with some rice. Or, you know, let's do, you know, throw some, some soy and oyster sauce. Boom. Uh, I was just thinking there was another one. Oh, I do a lot of like chicken stuff. You get a bunch of chicken thighs and like I'll do like a soya chicken. Take like a kilo of chicken thighs. Coat it all with oyster sauce, throw in a big spoon of ginger, uh, throw in some hard boiled eggs if you like, simmer all that away till it's cooked, shred it up, throw on rice. So it's a little fattier than uh, yep. the rest of it. Yep, but also more delicious. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. I'm not going to eat chicken breast unless I have to. Chicken breast is boring. Yes, yeah, so check check the Facebook group. So a few resources. You can check out my website, find me on Instagram. Uh, but the Facebook group is where we have a lot of like recipes and food ideas and resources and stuff. There's a lot of good sharing going on in there. So I'd highly recommend checking that out. Any other questions? You're hungry? I'm hungry. I'm hungry too. Yeah, yeah. I kind of I didn't buy some of food today actually. Ah, okay. Bradley had a question, probiotic or digestive enzyme. Bradley, uh, so we just kind of talked about probiotics. A digestive enzyme is a little bit different. I tend to not recommend those because although they help with digestion, it seems, and I might be wrong if the research is updated on this, but taking them when, or taking them from extended periods of time uh, may cause you to reduce the amount of those enzymes that you produce naturally. So kind of a Band-Aid can reduce your effectiveness over time if you take them too often. So don't take them heaps. Inversely, if you take something like a betaine hydrochloride supplement, so it's a stomach acid supplement, it's cheap, it's easy. Typically what you'll do, if you have difficulties with fats or proteins, you want more acidity. So you can take a betaine hydrochloride and betaine is B-E-T-A-I-N-E-H-C-L. <clears throat> and you take one tablet with your meal. And if you don't feel any heat or reflux, you take two tablets with your next one, three tablets on. And you keep titrating up until you start to feel a bit of heat and possibly like the precursor to reflux. And then you take one less capsule. And then you take that at each meal until... You start to feel refluxy, then you reduce that dose. And you continue to do that and reduce your dose over time, titrate down, uh, because it seems that it actually helps you produce more acid, which is what you want. You want a highly acidic stomach. So if you're having digestive issues around proteins or fats, I do that. If you have issues around carbohydrates, a probiotic might be a good option, but I don't know which one to recommend. Uh, so you'd probably have to do a bit of research on that. Cool. All right. Everyone's happy? No further questions? I was just going to ask something about regarding like hormones and like postnatal and that sort of yeah. thing. Does that impact on the way you absorb? Yes. So there's a few things there with, with menopause. So 
when you stop producing estrogen, estrogen is really important for the utilization of calcium in the body. So it's a, it's a big part of how calcium is taken and used from the intestine. So that's where we have the issue or the risk of osteoporosis. So the big thing for that is make sure you get lots of vitamin D. Uh, you have to take vitamin D with calcium. Um, otherwise, the calcium, there seems to be an issue where uh, the calcium can't be moved out of the bloodstream without vitamin D, which has led to heart attacks in the past, which is why they started combining calcium and vitamin D supplements, especially the osteoporosis focused ones. Uh, getting a bunch of vitamin K also helps with that. You can usually find those synergistic supplements or uh, just eat hard cheeses and like kimchi and fermented things, a lot of vitamin K in those. Uh, but yeah, you're gonna have to get probably more of those nutrients because you're gonna be less able to use them to get them out of your food. Resistance training is key. Worst thing you can do in the uh, high risk osteoporosis demographics is put them in a swimming pool where everything's easy and there's no weight bearing and it reduces your bone mineral density. So lift weights, walk as much as you can, any weight bearing and resistance exercise, lots of protein, vitamins C, D, K2, I believe it is. Um, and you can usually find those supplements together. So that would be the big stuff I think about. And more protein. <laughs> more protein. That's part of why I started coming to the gym anyway. It was aging. But I do have ab project ab at the moment. Yeah, I think that's a great one. And I have got onto the collagen bandwagon and bought the collagen and add that in as well, but I'm getting enough protein. Yeah, if you're getting enough protein, it's kind of useless. I famously use my hair. I've got it because I thought it'd be useful. I've got the bun. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's just, I mean, you need protein for hair, skin, and nails. Um, yeah, the collagen, like, you get all those proteins in, in a whey protein anyway. Yeah. If, if you have extra need for that, for some reason, like, it's not bad, but, like, I often tell my clients, if you eat a chicken, save the carcass, throw it in the slow cooker, make some broth, drink that. You know, you're already buying that protein, you might as well use it. Mm -hmm. Supplements, the same stuff. Cool. Yep. Well, folks... Thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Coming along. Thanks for tuning in to you guys. <laughs>